board has agreed to have this uh, really cool event here today uh, with Mike Reeder of Mike's Music. Uh, Mike's been a uh, guitar guy for over 30 years, has a whopping collection, wonderful store up in Clifton next to Bogart's. So, uh, fretboard, Mike's Music, find their pages on Facebook, give them a like, then you'll be sure to hear about things like this. So, that being said, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Reeder. Thank you guys, appreciate you coming. Thanks to Frank Bullard for having me out. This should be a fun time. And uh, most of you know who I am, but I'll just give you a little short, boring synopsis of what I've been doing for 30 years. Um, I started out as a guitar player, you know, writing music for my wife. And how this started was just a hunt for my own guitars, probably just like every one of you guys do. And you trade in the things that you want, the things that you think you haven't used for. And it just evolved into, you know, being obsessed with, you know, guitars and learning about vintage guitars. You know, at some point, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. I kind of had to justify it with a wife, you know what I mean? You know, so you turn it into a store. So that's, that's how that happens. So, um, you know, I started out on Route 8. We bought a building. My first store was in the basement of my house. It was called Mike's Music and Flea. And it quickly turned into Mike's Music Vintage Guitar Store. And over the last 30 years, you know, that's what I've been doing. And I've been lucky to meet lots of stars that come through Bogarts and help people out finding stuff. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been a real adventure, you know, finding good gear and learning about equipment. And, you know, I've had a lot of friends that helped me along the way. Original dealers, George Brune, and a lot of my friends have taught me a lot of things. So I'm here to share that with you guys. And hopefully you'll speak up. And if you have any questions, you'll just shout them out because I have nothing planned. So, you know, this series we're going to do up here, I'm going to try to do a feature item every time. Today we're doing vintage Stratocasters, and I bought a few of my personal ones. And you're certainly welcome to talk about stuff you have or any of that. And there's some seats up here if anybody wants to sit down. Might even get John to play a few strats for us, hopefully. Best strat player in town. So, yeah, I mean, uh, that's the thing. Recently, I was lucky enough to have one of my guitars asked to be um, replicated by Gibson. And they made this guitar here, which is... 90799, nicknamed Snake by Brad Whitford. And this is the prototype of that guitar. And that was an interesting thing, you know, process that took like three years. Gibson's having a hard time right now, but, and, you know, the custom shop was great to me. And this was a really fun process. So this is the prototype of what they call Snake. They took a lot of care to duplicate every single piece of it every scratch, every nick, and uh, you know, these are called True Historic Les Pauls, and there's, I think there's a total of like uh, 50 of these. They made 300 of my model, and uh, I love this guitar. It was a fun process, and as a Gibson Les Paul collector, it was a dream for me, so pretty cool. They call it the Mike Reader Burst. They're still for sale. I'm not a dealer, but you can see them out on the net. I think like uh, there's a couple on Reverb right now, maybe. But uh, we'll, we'll toss these around as they go. Uh, um, and this is another one of my Les Pauls on my collection. One of the things I'm going to do in the future up here is I'm going to do a Les Paul. I have a much bigger Les Paul collection than I do Strats. This is one of my favorite guitars that I play all the time. From collecting for years, you know, to me, I like a guitar that's already worn, that plays well and sounds good, and that's what's important to me, so that's why I kept this one. This is a 58, probably the dirtiest guitar I ever bought. When I bought it, it was covered in, like, black, and you can see, I'll eventually, I'll pass it around and show it to you guys, but there's still black under the knobs here. And the whole guitar was kind of like that when I bought it. And my, my luthier cleaned this for almost two days to get this clean. So yeah, this is a 58 gold top. They didn't make many gold tops in 58. That's the year they changed over to Sunburst. So it's pretty rare. And uh, when, I was, when I was collecting Les Pauls, 
trying to get my collection together. My thing was to try to get every version from every year and, you know, the minute details of each one. So the 58 with the humbuckers, the PAF, is a pretty rare guitar, you know, not that many of them. So this is one of the later ones that I got in my collection, and uh, I've used it in a lot of recordings lately, and just just love this guitar. Like I said, guys, shout if you got any questions. <laughs> this is probably the rarest Les Paul that I have. This is called a Mickey Baker model. Probably only one or two of these in the world. Um, they made some Mickey ba Baker models with three P90s. And some of you might know what P90s are. They're single coil pickups. Les Paul had Les Pauls had P90s and uh, Alnico pickups up until '56. Late 56, early 57, they went to these pickups, which are humbuckers. So most of the Mickey Baker models are uh, the P90 ones. Um, and I only know maybe a couple of these like this with humbuckers. Those of you that are familiar with Les Pauls know that it's very strange that they have three knobs like that. This guitar has three volumes and one tone, which is a really cool... Uh, it's not going to work, it's too... Um, it's a really cool idea. That way you can turn down the middle pickup. Which Mickey Baker was a player in the 50s. And if you Google him, he's actually really, really good. So, kind of like Les Paul had his own model. This was his model. But they didn't make many of them. Yeah, and most people have never seen one. If you go out on the net, Joe Bonamassa is a friend of mine. He played this last time he was in town. He pictures with, uh, him with it. And he recently got one as well. Actually, no, no. What he got was a two pickup model, which is also rare. The cool thing about this guitar is, you know, on a normal three pickup custom, the way it works is there's a switch here, and the, the neck position is just the neck, and the middle position is both of these pickups on at the same time. So, you can't really get just the middle pickup um, at all. Or you can't get these two pickups by themselves. Which is a sound that a lot of us ball players like. Which is one of the reasons why the three pickup custom never really became as popular as like standards. The custom was a more expensive guitar than a standard, even though now it's way less. And, you know, just a really cool guitar. This one sounds really good. I paid a lot of money for this guitar, more than my first two houses. So, you know, it's a really extremely rare guitar, and it's very clean. I bought it from the original owner out of California. And I've been trying to trace, you know, who ordered it and all that stuff, but I haven't had any luck. And it is a 57. Guitars like this are really strange and it's really nice. I mean, I don't know if you guys are collectors, if you're thinking about becoming collectors. One of the things about collections are, and an and important thing to do, if you find something really strange like that, often people think, you know, it's been altered or screwed with. Um, the more you see and the more you get around stuff, the more you have a sense. Thank you very much. You get a sense that, you know, just get a feeling that it's not screwed with, you know? And it's important to document things like where they came from and who owned them because there's people that have access to, you know, shipping logs and things like that. When I was a Gibson, I looked up a lot of my guitars that were strange, like that one. I have a Candy Apple Red Special, which is really, really rare guitar. It's actually Cardinal Red. And I found it in the shipping log. You know? And for years, I didn't know what the deal was, which is cool. So yeah, um, this three of my Les Pauls here, I didn't bring a lot of Les Pauls because I want to kind of save them for next time. And this is a guitar that I got locally. It is a 58 Epiphone cornet, which is a rare guitar. And it's the year that Gibson bought Epiphone. So it, it basically is a Gibson guitar in all ways, except it still has some of the original New York-made Epiphone parts, like this pickup right here. 
This, this was made, this is left over from the Epiphone company. And these knobs, which are my favorite knobs, they, they've got this like spider web, it's so really cool. When I bought this guitar, I didn't know that much about them. I had had a few, and they had all had serial numbers. This guitar didn't have a serial number, and I actually thought that it perhaps was refinished. As time went on, I learned that the very first ones never had serial numbers. They were transition guitars. And it's the same way on a lot of Les Pauls. Like the 52 Les Paul doesn't have a serial number. Early, late 53, early 54 black custom Les Pauls don't have serial numbers. So I'm not sure why that is. I think Gibson probably just wasn't 100% sure how many they were going to make or whatever. And you know that's why they did these serial numbers. But I think this is one of the coolest guitars I have, even though it's very simple. It's, it's a slab body, it's all mahogany, one mini humbucker pickup, which is a little bit microphonic. It's, it's a little bit like a lap steel sounding pickup, but it, it does sound good. The neck is a V neck, which you see on earlier Epiphones, like a, like a 30s style guitar. Very rare, kind of cool guitar. Another thing I wanted to say is, you know, when I started, it was much easier than it is now to find stuff. So I would travel around the United States and I would try to find things and I would hunt things down. I would maybe go on an adventure and like go to pawn shops and, you know, fill my van up and then end up meeting somebody whose dad was selling a guitar. And that's how a lot of my stuff, you know, came about in the, in the beginning. But, you know, the store has grown to a point now to where I'm lucky to know people who buy and sell and collect. So, uh, especially in this kind of world, the higher end of like Les Pauls, there's only like probably 20 people that really deal in these guitars. And a lot of times they get passed amongst those people. So, you know, it, it's, it's important to collect what you know and what you like. And don't think just because, you know, you're starting out with like a Japanese guitar or something that it's not cool. Because it is. You know, it's really cool. I bought this guitar because I bought it yesterday. And it was in the case in front of me and I really like it. Sometimes, you know, when you buy something, the first couple days it's like really special to you. And um, that's part of the joy of collecting, you know. And this is a 59 Rickenbacker combo 450 which is the same model that a good friend of mine plays you know uh, Robin who plays in Cheap Trick has one of these he plays it all the time and I just love that guitar and uh, also a very cool guitar Rickenbackers are kind of difficult to play if you've never had one they have tiny frets they're not like a lead guitar player kind of guitar they're more like a songwriter guitar but a unique jangly sound you can't get from anything else. And the earlier ones have what they call these anodized pick guards, which is which is a you know kind of a cool feature also seen on early fender stuff, 58, 59 fenders. This guitar here is a rare guitar and one of my favorite guitars because of two things. If you're an Eric Clapton fan, you probably saw him play a Summers Telly like this with a Stratocaster neck on it. And when I bought this guitar, the guy had a Stratocaster neck on it. And um, it was just, I don't really know why. He was, uh, he was a preacher out of West Virginia. And he had this guitar and a, a Strat, which didn't have the Telly neck on it. And a Les Paul, a 50s Les Paul. We ended up buying them all. And um, somehow I ended up with the neck down the line from him or something. But it's rare because it's sunburst. Telecasters are the only guitar in the Fender line that sunburst is a custom color. Um, sunburst on all other Fenders is the factory normal color. Uh, telecasters are always blonde unless you order one. This is a 60, 1960. Sunburst Telecaster with a three-ply, what they call a green pickguard. The earlier ones had a single pickguard, and you see more Sunburst ones then. It's a, kind of a transition guitar. 
If you're a Zeppelin fan, he had a Rosewood board Telecaster that sounds exactly like this guitar, which is why I kept it. Uh, I, I've refretted it, and it plays and sounds really and, uh, just a really cool guitar. You don't see many Green Guard Tellies, I'm not sure why. Most of them were, were there are just not many of them. I'm not sure why Fender didn't make many, but most of the guitars that you see are Telecasters are either earlier or later. It's just not that many slab board tellies. Um, so yeah, cool guitar. I mean, you do see sunburst on the custom Telecasters, which are the ones with the binding. But a normal one, you just they're not out there. Anybody got any questions or anything? Did anybody bring any guitars they want to share? <laughs> we can't see the red strap. Red strap? We'll get to the red strap. Stop causing trouble. You don't have to if you don't want to charge. Yeah. Yeah. We got a charger. Yeah, we got it. Yeah, I mean, it's always great to have the provenance of where the ownership chain has come from and all that stuff. It's rare people know. This guitar here, this bought last week, which I sold recently, is a 63, and I bought it from a local guy, a real good friend of mine, who's nice enough to sell it to me. 100% original. It was his dad's guitar, and he, uh, you know, he, he struggled with selling it because it, it meant a lot to him. But uh, he sold it to me and it's going to France, it's going to the collection, and cool guitar. It is an early veneer board. Stratocasters start out as maple necks. I guess I'll just talk about the strats now. Please, Alan. This is a 54. This is the first year of a Stratocaster. The early, early, early strats like this one, which is serial number 492, have what they call a football switch tip, which is this tiny tip right here, and these giant knobs. You know, really, only the first early strats have those. And all the all the plastic, besides the pickguard, is made out of bakelite, which is a kind of plastic that's brittle. You can see it's cracked. This guitar I kept in my collection because it was just so early and so clean. I'll show you a few things about it. That is a poodle case, yeah. I originally bought this guitar in Pennsylvania. I was at the Philly Guitar Show. And the guy was walking around the show and getting bids and getting attacked by all the dealers. And, you know, I made him a strong offer and the guy did the right thing. You know, he got a bunch of offers and walked around and went home. I got about halfway home and he called me and said, I'm going to sell it to you. So I drove all the way back to Philly after a long week of guitar show. And, I, I, you know, he wanted cash, so then I had to stay there the night and get cash the next day. And I'm glad I got the guitar. So, it has a bunch of cool stuff with it too, you know. I've sold this guitar once before, and when I first sold it, it had the original hand-typed instructions. With it. This is a tinsel thing that they sold it in, in the store, they would hang it from the neck. I've never seen that before with one of these. It's got the original strap, some strings from the 50s. Original uh, cloth, original arm and bar, which is different than the other straps. So it's it's bent more. If you, it's like it's more angled, and this is called a football tip. It's a little bit smaller, and it's it's kind of like this tip. So how long did they make like that for? I mean, that tip and bend is for what? Early, early 54. Just, the big line. Then, so what? Just then? I mean, they changed it after that? Yeah, they changed it to a different tip, and they changed um, the pit guard and all that, uh, the pickup covers and all that. They look different. The really super early strats, I had a prototype once, and it had the serial number on the back plate, which is... Right. Really, really early. 
And if you see these little circle holes, they changed that after early 54 too. They, they, they look different. Yeah. So anyway, I, I traded this guitar off to a friend of mine in like a big Les Paul deal. And it took me like 20 years to get it back. So. I originally paid ten thousand dollars for it, and when I got it back, I paid twenty-five. <laughs> well, it's a trade thing, you know. Actually, it might have been more. I don't even remember because there was multiple guitars involved. But I mean, I knew the history of the guitar. I knew everything about it. It's not a screw change. It's like perfect. <laughs> Oh, that, that is what the, yeah, that's curly cord. Like, you know those curly cords? The plastic reacts with the finish, so it probably had a cord in the case that it laid on. You see that on a lot of guitars. Yeah. It, it melted the lacquer, yeah. yeah. Most guitars nowadays are modified as well. Um, you played last night, didn't you? And you know, I'd sell a lot of player guitars, you know, a lot of tour bands come through, and in some ways that's like an easier thing for me to sell. You know, from a collector standpoint, it brings the value down. Things are not as, people are not as picky as they used to, you know. Like, I refretted my gold top because I knew that I was going to play it. I didn't care. Um, but it used to be a refret was a bad thing, and it mattered a lot. But I don't think so, so much, especially on a guitar that's like really a kind of player. Uh, and there's degrees to that, you know. If you, re if you refinish it or if you break the neck, all that stuff matters. But you kind of got to judge the guitar for what it is. There's a lot of 59 Les Pauls like Snake that have had a lot of repairs. In the Les Paul world, what matters is the figure, like the figure on the top, because most of them are plain, and there's very few of them that have a lot of flame. So, a really flamey guitar, like this one, even with a headstock repair or a bunch of issues, is worth more than a plain, perfect one. So, you know, I tell people if they're going to keep the guitar, make it to where you enjoy it. You know, that's what matters. You gotta collect what you enjoy. And for me, I gotta collect what I'm potentially gonna use, which is kind of a joke. But yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. All the all the early guitars were high quality, all the way up and probably until the seventies. And. Not all the true, not all the collector choice are high quality. Only the true historic ones have the good plastic and the good parts. I mean, some of them do, some of them don't. But like Snake is expensive. Like I think they list for about 14 grand. Most people sell them for 11 or 12. And the normal ones are anywhere from six to ten, which probably don't have high glue and they don't have the right plastic and that kind of stuff. But back to strats. So this is a 58, and this is a rare guitar because it is an original custom color. Most people think it's candy apple red. It's actually before they designated it candy apple red. A lot of the early 50 strats were red, if you look through the books. But, you see a lot of them that look like this in all the books and all like, a lot of these guitars were made for country swing players and western country players. I have another one, it's a 56, that has gold parts and it's like a, more like a solid red color. But, um, this guitar... I owned once a long time ago and sold it to Steven Seagal and I ended up getting it back from him. And it's really clean for a 50 Strat. It's, it's like super, super conditioned for a 50 Strat. And probably the only one in this red. It's very similar to Candy Apple, but it's a little bit more lighter finish than Candy Apple Red. 
Generally on this red, you'll see it very faded. This one's not faded very much. And you can tell by the neck how opaque it is and almost white, how clean the guitar is. This guitar, I have another 58 that I really, really play a lot. It's just a sunburst one. They sound very similar. To me, I would rather play a guitar that I'm not too worried about, you know. But it's super, super cool. And, you know, I'm going to pass these around. You guys want to check them out? Yeah. Sure, yeah. All the fenders were lacquer, nitro lacquer, nitro cellulose, all the way up until about 67. And then they started using poly. They started using poly on the bodies, but they still painted the necks in nitro. That's why you'll see like a headstock that's really yellow, and the bodies aren't. And that happens for a few years. Typically, typically the finishes were done really, really well. The people knew how to paint them. They were experts at it. This is another guitar that I kept. I actually don't like red. I don't know how I ended up with a bunch of red guitars, but this is another Candy Apple guitar. This one is rare because it's a matching headstock. They only did a handful of matching headstock guitars. This is 64, and it has a lot of transition features. It has what they call clay dots and a transition logo. And one thing I would like to mention, uh, the logos are on top of the finish, so don't ever rub the logos or this will happen. So, you know, this is a really, really rare, rare guitar. I've only seen maybe two or three other matching headstock guitars ever. And, you know, they're, like no one has a blue one, and I have a blue one, and I saw a black one, maybe a white one once. Um, as far as I know, this is the only red one. Interesting story. A friend of mine who plays with uh, Timothy B. Smith, he came to the store. He's a Rickabacker collector. And I had this guitar, a picture of it up or something, maybe on my Facebook page. And he said, you know, I owned a guitar like that once um, in the 80s. Long story short, he told me he was out on tour with Jimmy Buffett. They went back to a party at uh, you know, kind of a wild party and he went into a guy's bathroom and there was a red matching headstock Stratocaster in there. He needed a Strat at the time. He talked to the guy, talked to him out of the Strat. Well, it turns out it was this guitar. In the course of time, we found pictures of it. It was the exact same guitar. So when he came to town, I went to the show, went backstage, and we got a bunch of pictures with it. And, you know, it's weird how things like that happen. You know? Uh, yeah. That one? That one's probably worth somewhere between forty and seventy thousand dollars. Something like that. It wasn't coming to for a long time. Uh, it sounds really good. <laughs> That's why I kept it. When it comes to strats, the really hasn't ever went down. You know, Stratocasters and Vinny's, they, um, something went down. I think I'm losing my back. Check. Some things that went down, like, you know, Juniors, Les Paul Juniors, they went, you know, they were kind of relative because they were drove up by the prices of bursts and customs. Yeah, I'm going to need those probably. Um, and also, Green Day, actually single, drove up the prices because they bought a bunch of guitars for me at every guitar dealer in the world. So everybody went around and bought up Juniors for Green Day. And Les Pauls went crazy for a couple years and even this, the lower end guitars got drove up. So they have came down. But for the most part, in general, majority of vintage guitars have not come down. When the market crashed in 2009, Things did go a little scary for a while. Just like all collectible stuff and antiques, it slowed. But pretty fast, what back up, how you doing? You know what this? Okay. Okay. Can you tell us about the differences in the um, primer or undercoat, fuller class, whatever? Yeah, it's weird. Sure, yeah. Um, Candy Apple Red, different times, have 
has different colors. So in the 50s, like that guitar, there's no what they call desert sand or white finish, which is a sealer. And then they start doing that around 61. If you look at that red color, there's three layers. There's like a, a, a white undercoating, then a gold, and then kind of like a red stain and a clear. Whereas that paint, is, it's different. It's different. And that changes also. At some point later in the 60s, they go to silver instead of gold. They did make a gold. Now that's actually, that's the, the metal flake underneath the candy apple that you're saying. The red, red wears off really easy, and red also fades really easy. That's why, like, on a Sunburst Les Paul, this guitar looks yellow, but it originally had a big red ring around it, and it just faded. Did you ever get the red strap with Jim Howell? I did not get the red strap from Jim Howell. Alan was with me when we found a red strap, and we obsessed over it for like, two weeks, and we failed. So, yeah, I mean, that's the strats I brought with me. But, you know, one thing I want to say about Stratocasters is there's some important time period things. A 54 Strat is important because it's, like, historically significant. They also sound amazing. It's probably my favorite year of guitar for a Stratocaster. They're really early ones with the bank like parts are super rare. And then in the 56, they start making guitars that are not made out of ash anymore. Late 56, they, you know, 57, somewhere around there, they start making all their guitars. So that's kind of a significant change. And also 57 Stratocasters have like a V neck. They, they feel different than all the other Stratocasters. There's, you know, every year in the 50s has like changes, but I, these are the, what I consider to be the important differences. You have a 54, and the first really drastic change is around 57 when they change the neck size and the feel of the guitar, which is what Eric Clapton played. And then the next major change, I would say, would be around 61 when they go to the slab boards, which is a thick rosewood fretboard, and the necks get really tiny. And then after that, they go to this guitar, which is a, a veneer, veneer board. And the, and the sunburst starts to change then. If you notice the sunburst is kind of tight, there's not much yellow. The more you go into the newer guitars, the wider the sunburst gets. And the yellow starts to get more yellow. You lose a lot of the red. So Stratocasters are important guitars because, you know, uh, Jimi Hendrix, you know, so many great players have played Strats. Johnny Fink plays a Stratocaster. <laughs> Influenced many of us. And um, so, just really, really cool, important guitars. I mean, it's the kind of thing you just really can't improve on. In 74, they changed the the switch to a five-way, which is another pretty significant thing. I mean, there's a lot of changes, but that's that's another pretty important thing. And in 1966, the headstocks get larger, which is also kind of cool. I like 66 strats. They have larger frets. They have big necks. That's a 64. Some of the other guitars I brought with me, just because I thought they were kind of cool. I have a thing for like green and blue guitars. This is a country gentleman. I bought it from a local guy out of Indiana. It's 100% original. I just think these, the Gretches have so much style. They're just like super cool. They took a lot of time and a lot of thought in the style of this guitar. Down to the cases, you know. They made the cases super fancy. They have banners inside of them. The 6120 is like Brian Setzer plays. You know, they have like cowboy cases and cowboy straps. And, you know, they sound really good and just great show guitars. This is Cadillac Green. A lot of the colors, you know, on guitars were taken from cars, you know. So that's where they got the colors. And there was Cadillacs in this color. This country club was the top of the line for Gretsch. A lot of jazz players played them. A lot of rockabilly guys played them. It's always strange to me that they put gold parts in the entire guitar and then they put a chrome Melita bridge, which they did on everything, I'm not sure why. 
And these are lays are called humping lays. Whenever you see these humping lays, you know instantly it's a 57. These were only used in 57, which is cool. It's also George Harrison played a 57 do a jet, so he's the one that kind of made that popular. You guys are certainly welcome to check it out if you want. Hey brother, how you doing? This is a prototype bass that I had made for me. When you go to the guitar shows, often there will be a new luthier set up and he'll be selling his own guitars, making his own guitars. And I always feel kind of bad for him because all the vintage nerds kind of annoy him. So he's always sitting there and you know how many hours and time he put into his stuff. Well, I became friends with Taya, who is a, a guitar maker who makes these guitars kind of based on Z Zamatis guitars, which were English guitars that um, a lot of the Stones played and a lot of, a lot of English rock stars played Zamatis guitars. He created his own guitars. He's a master engraver and he hands engraves all the plates on all these guitars. We became friends and he was talking about making bass and I play a lot of bass so I said why don't, why don't you let me help design a bass and let's do a bass. Well he was a super fan of Stones and he really liked like uh, the Dan Armstrong Lucite bass and short scale basses. So in the course of a year, I convinced him to make a long scale bass for me because I don't put short scale basses. And he made this bass for me, it's the first one. Actually, I think it might be the second. It's the first prototype of a long scale. He had made one short scale bass before that. And the combination of this bass came apart because I play Stingrays. So I put two Stingray pickups in it. So it's sort of a cross between a Gibson bass and a Stingray bass. And he has a special tone circuit that he calls the Mood. It has a Mood knob, which is similar to kind of like a parametric EQ on a mixing board, or if you took a five-way switch on a Strat and turned it into a knob. It sweeps, it sweeps the high end, really. I love this bass. I use it a lot for recordings, and it has a really big, warm sound. It has turquoise around the outside, and a hand, hand engraved uh, plate. It also has a hand engraved back plate, which I took off because I didn't want to destroy. And, um, so this is actually one of my personal bases that I use. I thought it was important because if, if the business is going to continue and we're going to have new things, we need to support people who do stuff like this. You know? So you guys can check it out. The engraving was inspired by me, although he, you know, did his own thing. While we're on the bases, I'll talk a little bit about this base right here. This base belonged to Tom Peterson of Cheap Trick, who's a good friend of mine, great dude. And when he comes to town, you know, we hang out a lot, he shows me his stuff. We were at a guitar show and he was excited because he had just got this bass. He had it commissioned from a friend of ours who was a luthier. This is a reproduction of the only Gibson Explorer bass that was ever made. And they spent a couple years making a, a replica of it. And Tom kept it for a while, played it, used it, and he knew I really liked it. So he called me and I ended up with it, thanks to him. But it's made out of Karina wood. And the original, the original bass came from Cincinnati. It actually belonged to Lonnie Mack's bass player. So if, if you look at the, Lon the Lonnie Mack stuff, you'll see this bass. They painted them purple, but it had been refinished and it's passed around on a collector since. The bass now presides in Las Vegas in a collection, and someday maybe I'll get it. But, um, so this is an exact replica of that bass. The original bass had been altered and changed many, many times. I, I just did a recording with this bass two days ago. Sounds great. Very, very low end, kind of a big, hearty kind of sound. Cool thing is the guy actually made a case for it in extreme, extreme detail. Used latches, old handles, 
he even took the time to uh, to make a little explorer latch, you know. Sure, which I think he did mostly for Tom. Just be very careful with the uh, pickup colors. Be careful with the covers on it, because they'll break. So anyway, that, that's a cool base. It's one of the things I kept because a friend gave it to me, and I think I'll never get the real one, so. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I carried no, the guy actually, yeah, this is a real pickup, but they, I think they made the cover. I'm not sure. Well, this, these, these are interesting because the, the pull pieces moved. Originally they were up here, and then they moved to the middle and then to... I don't really collect like jazz guitars, it was never my thing, but I kept this guitar basically just for the fact that I never had a really cool one. It's the first year of a Super 400, and the very first Super 400s, I don't know if you can tell, but the body is kind of shaped like an 8. They're, they're more egg shaped, the top bout is smaller, only the first 50 or 100, thank you. Um, and to me this is just a, like a deco masterpiece, you know, made in the 30s, just the top of the line of handcrafted guitars. There's so much detail in this guitar that you don't see today. They engraved Super 400 on the back. They engraved the, you can't see it very well, I'm sure, but the tailpiece is hand engraved. The pit guard, everything about it just screams deco. Very cool. Has an inlay on the back of the headstock. The, the luthiers at Gibson that made these guitars were true masters. I mean, the, the top is carved, the back is carved. It's, uh, you know, just beautiful. And what you see there is, you know, like that figure, it's like matches a fiddle at the top. These luthiers were taught by European fiddle makers, and that's kind of where they got these concepts. You know? Multiple binding. I'm going to pass this around. Just be careful of the pick guard, brother. So be careful of the pick guard on it. I don't believe Lloyd Lloyd was involved in this. That was right after his time period. Um, it could be. Um, at that time, it'd be factory order numbers. Yeah. Um, only the real early ones look like that. They change very quickly. I didn't bring a lot of flat tops, but I brought a couple strange ones. This is a re recording king, and this model is called a Ray Whitley. Most of the Ray Whitley say Ray Whitley on the headstock. This one does not. What's very clean, extremely rare guitar. The, the body is what you would Gibson would call a jumbo body at this time. It's a little bit bigger than like a J45. The neck is very V'd. And there's not very many of these. And I just think it's just one of the coolest guitars. It also sounds amazing. Recording King was kind of like an off-brand, like an Epiphone. Gibson had, you know, a variety of different companies that were making their guitars and selling things through them. So Recording King was an off-brand. So check it out. Check the neck out. Yeah. Oh, that's like a 39, 1939. Re Recording King, there is a new company now. But yeah, Gibson made Recording Kings too. They, they sold the name. And this is the only other guitar I brought with me. This is the thing that is not like the others. Um, this is called a Gittler. 
It's all, it's all right, man. It is made in Israel. Probably the only time you've ever seen anything like this is Synchronicity 2 video with the police. You'll see, you'll see them playing these Gitler guitars. They're interesting because they're basically stainless steel cast. Every string, these bars are actually pickups. So every string has its own pickup and it has like a multi-pin uh, jack so you can you could actually play with like six amps if you wanted to and have every string on its own. Also the back comes off. These two screws, three screws, you can take off the back. And when you do, you can still play it, but it's just the metal. So the frets stick out. This was like an option because it was kind of hard to play that way. And if you look at the Synchronicity 2 police video, you'll see that they don't have the back on theirs. Just a really cool guitar, you know? It's, it's art, and it's a new design. And, you know, very interesting. These are the tuning pegs down here. Check it out if you want. Yeah, that is the most scalloped neck you'll ever see. It's kind of cool, too, that on the back, this is how you, if you loosen this, it takes the strap and you can flip it either way. So it can become left-handed or right-handed, because there is no left or right. The only other thing I brought was this Princeton Reverb. Johnny, if you want to come up, man, you want to play it? Want to, want to play the strats and kind of show them the difference of the sounds? Do it, Johnny! So John is playing a 63 Strat, 100% original, and Sunburst. Uh, 60, what year is that, Elton? 66? 60 cents, 66 Princeton Reverb. So, everybody, give a big hand to Mike Reader. Thank you, Mike.